miners aren't selling their Bitcoin, they're holding their Bitcoin. So that's impacting the available supply of Bitcoin in the marketplace. It's not a bug, it's an actual feature of Bitcoin. You know, you don't have 70 or 80 big holders of Bitcoin that determine what happens in the Bitcoin world. You're seeing smart contract functionality being brought into Bitcoin. One of my former CTOs had gone all in in crypto in 2013. It's very clear after speaking with so many people that we're still in such the early days. He was one of the early investors in Facebook and Yahoo placed a billion dollar bid. So Fred, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. When diving through your background, it's it's really incredible because everyone has heard about Marathon, especially if they're in uh, mining. But I don't think a lot of people understand all the different facets that you have coming into it in your career. It's almost like your background shaped you perfectly to run a Bitcoin mining company. Um, and you're quite the futurist. So um, I think that everyone listening, you're going to learn a lot and get a lot of value from listening to Fred today. Well, thank you. Setting a very high expectation. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, I'm, I'm sure you're going to meet it and blow everyone else away. To, to dive right into it, with the stuff that you're doing at Marathon, what really led you on this path to deciding to say, hey, I'm going to go and I'm going to run one of the biggest mining companies in the entire world? How, how did you land in the position that you're in right now? Well, I've been in the tech industry for 40 years and I've kind of operated in every segment of it, hardware, software, semiconductors, internet, data comms, internet services, online games, was a very avid gamer for a number of years and ran one of the largest digital media companies in that space, GameSpy, for a while. And so I've always been kind of at the forefront of these little bit more disruptive technologies. And I'm old enough to have programmed on punch cards and IBM 360 mainframes where I got kind of my early day start, uh, even using acoustic couplers and telex machines, all the way through the advent of the PC, kind of the death of the mini computer, if you would. And then just saw the whole internet and data comms business. And it, a lot of the work that I did early on in my career was actually writing software in banks. So I was very familiar with the banking space. And my dad was a banker and uh, my stepmom was a senior economist at the OECD responsible for writing banking regulations. And so I kind of grew up in this environment where, God, you know, this is a very inefficient industry. And how do you make it more efficient? And um, long story short, about 2016, uh, I got very involved in looking at kind of crypto and what Bitcoin could do. One of my former CTOs had gone all in in crypto in 2013 and was just kept calling me saying, you listen, you got to get you got to get in on this. This, you know, this is for you. This is the right industry. And thought about looking at building an exchange, crypto exchange for trading and interconnecting a bunch of exchanges globally. And this was very early days, but coming from a kind of family where regulatory was kind of the dinner table conversation, I thought, well, why don't I see how illegal is this? <laughs> And you know, what I realized pretty quickly was in the US, there was no way you could open a license exchange because nobody would give you a license. I mean, a bank wouldn't even open a bank account for you if you said the word crypto in those days. So I went to Switzerland, worked with the folks at FINMA there, which is the equivalent of the financial regulator, if you would, and quickly saw that a US company in Switzerland, this is post UBS and, and or Credit Suisse and the IRS issues. They just, Americans were kind of persona non grata in the financial market there because they didn't want the regulatory backlash. And so went to Liechtenstein and actually worked with a law firm there to get their first crypto law instantiated and then got the first licensed OTC trading desk done there. And, you know, it was early days when anybody trading crypto, you kind of had to look at them a little sideways and wonder, OK, now, uh, how are you talking about trading 100,000 BTC and where are these from? And KYC AML was kind of a little wonky. Fast forward to 2017 and Mariko Komodo, who's the former CEO and former chairman of Marathon, uh, who I've known for many, many years, said to me, hey, listen, I'm stepping into this role as CEO of this company called Marathon Patent Group, and we want to do some Bitcoin mining. And I know that, you know, you're Mr. Technology. Would you would you join our board? So I got on the board of Marathon. I joined in April of 2018 and worked with Merrick on his kind of strategy of uh, recapitalizing the company and uh, positioning as a, as a leading miner. And um, my expertise being in scaling businesses and his expertise being in really, you know, um, the financing of businesses. It was a great kind of teamwork effort, you know, fast forward to kind of last year, and it was clear that now was time to just focus on scaling. He had done an excellent job at getting the company financed and properly set up. So it was all about execution. And so we decided to swap roles at that point. And I stepped in as CEO, he went into an executive chairman role. And then he decided that it was time for him to retire at the end of last year, which he did. 
And um, that's kind of how I got involved in the mining business. I think it, it's an exciting space in that we're, on the one hand, creating the next generation of financial systems. And the role of miners is really that of being the securitizer, if you would, you know, our, by processing our blocks and doing it um, the way we do it, we're helping secure the blockchain and ensure the safety and security of data on the blockchain, while at the same time, effectively, if you think about the Bitcoin blockchain, it's effectively the equivalent to what TCP IP was to the internet. And, you know, our perspective, at least my perspective is we're kind of in 1997 in internet time. You've got this thing called a, a Netscape browser, you can browse some websites, but you still haven't really gotten to the point where you can write content and uh, share content or where you can effectively own things on the internet. So, you know, 1997, if you think back to that time, it was pretty rudimentary. Um, and that's where we are today uh, in the world of blockchain. And I think we're going to see with Web 3.0 data separating itself from applications, data will reside on the blockchain, applications will run on servers on demand. You, If you think about how Amazon AWS or Google Cloud or Microsoft Azure run today, they're this constantly on application married to data architectures and the web 3.0 world that can change, right? You only have to turn on the applications when you need them. And oh, by the way, on your customer data, you could use a CRM tool from a number of different vendors, depending on what you want to do with your data, right? And your data is independent of the application. So, you know, it's not going to happen next year. It's not going to happen in the next two or three years, but if you look at a lot of the money that the large venture firms are putting into the space today around Web 3.0, it's all really focused on this abstracting data from applications and building these next generation systems where companies and individuals own their data. And as you look at the two primary blockchain ecosystems, Bitcoin and Ethereum and the Ethereum-like blockchains, the Bitcoin blockchain is all about ownership and security. If security is your primary concern, then the Bitcoin blockchain is where you want to build stuff. And with Lightning and the layer two systems that are coming online, there's no limit really, a uh, practical limit on transaction speed or, or, you know, low cost of transactions. And you're seeing that with kind of the applications that Strike is rolling out around the world and other people are doing there. You're going to see a lot of identity management tools being built on the Bitcoin blockchain, health data, things like that. The Ethereum blockchain is all about innovation and programmability. So that's where people can really innovate, create these smart contract-based systems and do some really cool things. But it's not a network that's necessarily uh, built on the same security premises that the Bitcoin blockchain is built on. And as you look at the world of smart contracts and a lot of these DeFi businesses, yeah, you continually read about systems are being hacked. You know, there was a thing in the news this week about OpenSea and people being able to do all sorts of sh shenanigans there. So I, I think that's just the difference, right? Kind of you've got this great sandbox in the Ethereum world where all this really cool stuff is happening. And then you've got stodgy kind of Bitcoin <laughs> and the maximalists will hate me for that. But things move slowly on purpose in the Bitcoin world because it's secure, because it's fully decentralized. There isn't a central governance organization. You know, you don't have 70 or 80 big holders of Bitcoin that determine what happens in the Bitcoin world like you do in other blockchains. Yeah, you know, we're super excited. And I, I love the innovation pace that's happening here. I think there's some, you know, um, Jack Dorsey's doing some great things. I think Jack Mahler's doing some great things. There's a lot of great things happening in the space. And so we're super excited. You just brought us down an amazing rabbit hole that I want to dig further down with you uh, regarding the Web 3.0, right? And talking about how you're seeing smart contract functionality being brought into Bitcoin via Taproot. And as you mentioned, it moves much more slowly, but that's not a it, it's not a bug, it's an actual feature of Bitcoin. And it mm -hmm. gives you a lot of that security. And then you have the other end where you have Web 3.0 on things like Ethereum, and it can move much more quickly. But I guess the big question that, that I want to ask you is, how do you view those applications being built outside of the Bitcoin ecosystem now that you're seeing Bitcoin come up to speed? Because Bitcoin, obviously, it's much more slower moving, but at the base layer, you have much more security with Bitcoin. And that is going down to the ethos of decentralization and blockchain to, meant to a large degree saying, hey, this is great that we have this. Uh, how do you think that these other cryptos fare now that Bitcoin is implementing smart contract functionality and you're seeing developers go and try and implement with Bitcoin as the base layer? Yeah, I don't think it's a zero sum game by any means. I, I think just like as you look at any technology, 
there's a period of innovation and evolution where all sorts of things come up. You know, there's, you can think of it as, uh, you know, mutation's the wrong word, but the term of nature it really is a type of morphing that happens. And you get all these different things that start rising up. And then eventually people start gravitating to the technologies and the platforms that make the most sense. And then you get some sort of Darwinism where eventually the ones that are less efficient, you know, won't survive. Look at the search engine world in the world of the traditional internet, right? Google wasn't the first search engine by far. You had all sorts of search engines before that. Same thing in social media. You had lots of things before Facebook. And yet eventually one platform managed to kind of become the most relevant because it provided the closest to what the consumers wanted. I think the difference between the world of blockchain and the world of the internet is that the internet is one internet. And that was because there was no economic incentive around owning the internet. It was a national security thing. The US started it with DARPA and then universities leveraged it. And there wasn't an economic incentive ever. The economic incentive was all at layer two and above. In the world of blockchain, it's very different. Uh, there are economic incentives in owning the governance token and issuing the governance token. Again, in the world of Bitcoin, that's fully decentralized. There isn't a, an economic interest there but in the other blockchains there is. And so as you have this kind of development that's going to occur, there are incentives for companies to develop their own layer one blockchains. Question is, will they survive or not? So I tend to find that development over the next three years will migrate to layer two and layer three. And you're really going to have either the EVM kind of Ethereum world, or you're going to have the Bitcoin world, but you're going to have all these bridging protocols between them and these bridging tools that will allow you to, for example, there's a protocol that's being built for settlement where it's a proof of stake model, but it uses proof of work, leveraging the Bitcoin blockchain's proof of work. So not having to do double work as the independent control such that the proof of stake is truly managed in a way that can't be controlled. And so I think you're going to start seeing some of these hybrids where it's kind of proof of stake with a proof of work component to it, which piggybacks on top of the Bitcoin blockchain's proof of work. So I think that's super exciting. And we're going to start seeing also the ability to where people are going to just start the what I call the consumerization a little bit of Bitcoin mining and crypto mining in general, where, you know, that people are going to set up things in their garage and in their basement and, um, run various coins and mine various coins. And you'll eventually start seeing this becoming a integrating into a core part of kind of infrastructure and ecosystems, you know, as power generation moves from central utilities out to community edge power generation. So a community would have its own solar panels and battery storage. They may want to add a small number of Bitcoin miners as a way to monetize excess electricity when they're generating more than they're consuming, use that to pay for the whole solar infrastructure. And then, you know, take that at a larger scale and you'll find cities wanting to do that and schools possibly doing it and so bitcoin mining starts becoming an integral part of the energy infrastructure system as a key financing tool for financing this renewable energy that we all depend on and you know the thing people forget about the energy world is a it's not a zero-sum game there's lots of energy available if you just invest in it, which is something Bitcoin miners obviously are doing. The other thing is solar and wind doesn't run 24 seven. And so there are times of the day where you have free energy that's being wasted because the grid can't use it because consumers don't want it. Industry doesn't want it. And so mine Bitcoin with that energy because otherwise you're wasting it. You're essentially having to throw it away effectively because uh, you can't store it. So I think we're going to see a lot of changes as proof of work really becomes just a function of home solar systems. It becomes a function of some electric vehicles. It'll just be a built-in function. And uh, that's going to be a real exciting time, I think. Yeah. When you talk with a lot of these miners, you see that a lot of them are talking about mining and energy in this way. And the people outside the industry are the ones really attacking Bitcoin for its energy use. But I don't think that they really understand at its core what's happening when these miners come in. And as you mentioned, like many of the other miners, uh, big miners who understand how the energy sector works and understand how mining works, you see that it's very good to help spur renewable development. Um, it brings me to this next point or this next question for you is where are we in this journey? Because as we see today, it looks a lot different in mining than it did four years ago. And I'm sure that four years from now, the mining industry is gonna look a lot different uh, we had the halvening back in 2020, and so the next one's coming up in 2024. So there are so many different factors here, and you guys as, as a very big player in this have a lot of different variables that you have to take into account. So I'll, I'll leave it more so open-ended, but how are you looking at this entire space as a miner? 
and as a participant and understanding that you're dealing with all these market forces that are quite frankly out of any miner's control. How, how are you looking at it today uh, in the beginning of uh, 2022? I think the environment has changed over the years. For one thing, miners aren't selling their Bitcoin, they're holding their Bitcoin. So that's impacting the available supply of Bitcoin in the marketplace. And since the halving in 2020, obviously there are only 900 Bitcoin minted a day or rewarded a day. And so as a miner, you know, we're obviously constantly competing with our colleagues in the industry for those 900 Bitcoin. And, you know, in a little over two years from now, 26 months, we'll have another halving and then it'll be 450 Bitcoin a day. So we're very focused on growing our capacity as quickly as possible because we think growth is going to get harder and harder over time. If you look at the expectations of global hash rate growth, you take Bidudas numbers, for example, they're expecting it to go from, you know, we ended 2021 at around 180 exahash, or between 170 and 190. So I'll use 180 as the average. And, you know, the expectation is we'll be at 320 at the end of 2022. You know, that's not too far short of a doubling. And then figure another 50% increase in 2023. And then you have a halving in 20, early 2024, March of 2024 at this point. So you're essentially looking at a threefold increase in cost to mine between now and the halving. And when the halving happens, it'll double that cost. So, you know, a 6x increase in the cost of mining. If you are going to deploy a lot of miners next year, then the rewards you're going to get are going to be that much less than if you deployed that um, hash rate today. So we're very focused on as quickly as possible, deploying as much capacity as possible, such that the harder it gets to mine in the future, we'll already have our miners in place, we'll already have paid for them, and we'll be able to benefit from that. Uh, granted, we have a very unique model in how we operate. Uh, we don't invest in infrastructure, we don't own the infrastructure, and we're fully focused on being 100% carbon neutral. So what that means is all our investment dollars are going into just miners. We're not buying facilities. We're not tying down power in the traditional way. And so unlike some of our competitors in the industry, we have the ability to, you know, when our hosting agreements are up, pick up our miners and move somewhere else. And we personally believe that while 2021 was a year of many constraints, there weren't many miners available to purchase and there wasn't hosting capacity available to put miners into 2022, especially the back half of 2022, you're going to see a huge amount of capacity come online, both hosting facilities and uh, availability of miners. And that's going to continue in 2023. We believe the power companies are going to play a bigger and bigger role in building and investing in hosting facilities, even some of them doing their own mining. You know, I would say, you know, keep your eyes peeled to the news lines because more than likely over the next three to six months, you'll see a number of power companies announced there actively coming into this business and power being our single biggest input cost by partnering with the power companies and them providing the hosting for us. We think we're uniquely positioned for the long term and our cost today to mine a Bitcoin energy plus hosting is a little over $6,000. So 6x increase in that cost would be $36,000. So as long as Bitcoin is trading somewhere north of $60,000 in 2024, we'll still have a very profitable business. That won't necessarily be the case for some other miners whose cost structures don't provide for that low cost today. So I think you'll also see some consolidation down the road in this business. Hearing you talk through it is really interesting how you guys take a very mathematical approach to this and a very pragmatic approach. Sometimes when you talk with miners who are a lot of times just getting into the business, they won't take these things into account. And it's crazy because it's something that directly affects your bottom line. And so you want to understand where the hash rate's going and where the price might be going. Uh, in terms of the machines that you guys have online, because you're not going in and you're not investing in that infrastructure, it allows you to take a more aggressive approach to actually scaling up purely with miners. W what are, some, do you have any highlights or recent updates in terms of some of the deployments that you have going out and some of the areas in which you're focused on mining? Is it all in the US or are you looking at any other countries around the world in terms of where you're placing those miners? We made a decision to stick to North America. At this point, we're only in the US. We're not in um, 
in Canada at all. The reason being rule of law is really important to us. Uh, you know, we're a public company. Last thing I want to do is put $500 million of miners in a location where all of a sudden some Jeeps roll up because there's a new government and they've decided they want to own my Bitcoin miners and there's nothing I can do about it. So, you know, you've seen what happened in China, you know, last year they made crypto mining and all the crypto industry effectively illegal. And so uh, those miners got shut down. Kazakhstan is having power problems. Europe, not for regulatory reasons, is having some problems with energy because they decided to curtail their nuclear and their fossil fuel power generation and rely on renewable a little too early. And they hadn't built up enough capacity such that uh, they could deal with shortages of energy. And now when they have the hydro is underproducing and the wind isn't blowing enough, they're having pretty big energy shortages. In the US, we don't have those issues. We generate 14% more energy than we consume in this country. And that's even before all of the new renewable energy that's coming online here this year and next year by people like Nextera and Constellation comes online. And so you're going to see gigawatts of additional power come online in the US. And energy, if you can't sell it, you can't earn any revenue. And so, you know, having customers like big Bitcoin miners like ourselves is a huge benefit to the power companies because they now have one large customer who will more than pay for the cost of that infrastructure that they're building. But more importantly, if the grid does need the extra electricity, you know, they can always curtail us and we'll voluntarily curtail such that they can take, you know, 100 megawatts, 200 megawatts and put it into the grid as opposed to telling you as a consumer, hey, I'm going to have to turn you off your air conditioner because it's 105 degrees where you are, which you're not going to want. So I think most people, most consumers, most voters would prefer that, hey, shut down the Bitcoin miner when I, when there's a shortage of electricity, especially if the Bitcoin miner is volunteering to do it. So, And I think most of my peers in the industry are all, generally speaking, you know, good citizens and want to participate. But we like North America, good rule of law. There's some great markets. Texas has an unregulated kind of power grid through ERCOT. Uh, you have other uh, grid operators uh, throughout the U.S. who are great places. We today mine kind of Nebraska down through to Texas. And, you know, we'll continue to expand across the country wherever it makes sense. We don't want to be too concentrated in any one area such that, uh, you know, we suffer any particular regional outages or other things because of you know weather, climate, energy conditions, grid technology, regulatory issues or whatever. The bigger you get, the more you have to worry about those types of risks where when you're small, you don't. And you know, we're scaling from, if you think about, you know, we exited 2021 nearing kind of four X a hash of capacity and this time next year. So January, 2023, we'll be at 23 X a hash. I mean, that's a huge jump in capacity. And, you know, that's all based on the miners we have on order today. So we'll have, you know, 199,000 miners. And by the way, people always ask me, why couldn't we order another thousand miners to make it around 200,000? There aren't any available. We'll be one of the largest miners globally at that point and all doing it in the U.S. and you know, looking forward to kind of contributing to the Bitcoin ecosystem as a great participant and citizen. That's great. And it makes a lot of sense. It's a lot easier to move 199 miners than 199,000. So if you don't want to, <laughs> that, that would be quite, quite the feat. Uh, <laughs> uh, so going off of that and talking about your view of the energy sector, it, it's fascinating because one of the things that we've tried to do on this podcast is speak with a lot of people who understand energy, who are active in the energy sector and get their views on it. And one of the interesting things that I heard from someone who's in the mining space, uh, Lee Bratchard, president of the Texas Blockchain Council, when those rolling blackouts were happening in Texas, the miners, they were all doing exactly what you mentioned. They were curtailing their load and they were contributing that to the grid. And I think it's, it's like a virtual battery and it build, builds grid resiliency. Um, so I think that that's something that's going to continue to happen. But just going off of that, going towards the next phase of this industry, what do you think is going to be happening with the energy sector in this next phase, right? Because you mentioned that they're moving towards possibly becoming miners, but in this whole timeline, is this something that's hap that you see happening in scale like over the next six months to a year? Or is this something that is maybe like three to five years away? You're going to see some energy companies putting their toes in the water this year, actually in the next six months. And, you know, I'll let them make those pronouncements themselves. <laughs> but, you know, we're very familiar with a number of them because we're partnering with them. 
you'll also see as you look at the renewable energy space so there there are two challenges one is renewable energy is intermittent right it basically there's this concept called the duck curve which is in the middle of the day when consumers actually aren't using electricity most consumers use power from 4 p.m until 8 or 9 p.m at night because it's air conditioning heating it's washing machines dishwashers cooking etc most renewable energy is made during the day middle of the day and so that duck curve, because it represents the belly of a duck on the demand. Normally, the grid would shut down the power generator. Hey, don't send us any more power. So they could use that excess energy for Bitcoin mining so that it's not losing that value. And return on investment from that Bitcoin mining would help pay off the renewable energy deployment so they could deploy even more. And then they take a portion of that renewable energy during the middle of the day and they use it for essentially making hydrogen, green hydrogen. And the way you make green hydrogen is you use electricity and you take a water molecule, you split it into oxygen and hydrogen, and then you store the hydrogen. And then when you're renewable energy source goes offline because there's no sun or wind, you then spin up a turbine that runs hydrogen and you have very clean energy generation for the dark hours. And that's a much better battery than lots of physical batteries because it's uh, easy to store and uh, you can turn it on and off as you want it. Whereas batteries are very expensive and when you're not using them, they just cost a lot of money. I think what you're going to see is the renewable energy companies are going to be doing Bitcoin mining, use Bitcoin miners as a capacitor for when the grid needs excess capacity, they can take it away from the Bitcoin miners and bleed it into the grid. They'll use hydrogen for generating more consistent baseload energy, which will give them more of a 27, 24-7 profile, which will allow the rest of the power industry to start shutting down more fossil fuel because one of the key things is you need nuclear and you need fossil fuel power generation for that 24 seven baseload, which renewable can't do yet, but renewable will be able to do it with the augmentation of energy storage and hydrogen. And so as that starts developing, then what you're also gonna see is this movement of power from central utilities out to the edge where communities start generating their own power, which essentially brings us back to a world where the grid was originally designed for, which is balancing energy load as opposed to transmitting energy load. You know, the, you can only send electricity 500 miles before it starts being highly wasted. And in the US today, arguably, we waste upwards of 8% of the energy we generate through just load losses. So not curtailment, this is just loss of energy because you're sending it down a wire. And you know that is enough gigawatts of energy to more than power the whole Bitcoin mining industry globally, which again, you know, the whole Bitcoin mining industry globally uses less than 0.2 of a percent of the electrical energy generated in the world. So very, very, very small amount of energy. And we're very focused also on deploying latest generation hardware. So we're deploying S19 XPs in the back half of this year. So our fleet will be 50-50 X19s and X19 XPs. The XPs are 30% more energy efficient than S19 uh, J Pros. You know, in that way, we're also reducing the energy consumption uh, from our mining operations. And we're very focused as an investor in investing in technologies that will continue to bring Bitcoin mining to a net zero energy. Going off of that, with the regulation that's going to be happening, a lot of people are looking at it, what's going to happen with regulation in the US, what's going to happen in some of these other countries, and how is that going to affect the mining industry and, mm -hmm. and uh, the sector as a whole? How do you think, in particular, the US is going to respond now that, I mean, we're talking about much more institutional capital coming in, we're talking about really being at the beginning of this industry in many ways, like 1997 for the internet. You have a lot of people talking about how scary this could be if things are put into law that could limit this industry, or if the US makes a crazy move like China did. Uh, what, what do you think the possibilities are, or how this will shake up in the US? Quickly, the best way to figure out what somebody's going to do is look at what the incentives are driving in an industry. The Bitcoin and the crypto industry today is a multi-trillion dollar industry. If the government were to shut it down completely, A, you have to ask the reason why. In the case of China, in the case of Russia, in the case of countries where they've lost control of their own currencies, you have to shut down crypto because it's an easy way for people to put their value, their assets into crypto. And at that point, it's outside of the current financial world that that government controls. In the case of China, for example, it was the issue that they wanted to be able to control people's assets and control currency 
And the minute people put money in Bitcoin, it's outside of the country, you know, instantly. And so they needed to put a stop to that to control their currency because that's part of how they want to control their economy. In the case of Russia today, here's kind of some bluster about they're going to make it illegal. Same reason. They need to control the economy. If oligarchs and people put all their money into crypto, Russian government can't freeze it. They can't seize it. They can't do anything, right? It's, think of all the reasons why Bitcoin exists. I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago in Switzerland, the CFC conference, the crypto finance conference, and spoke. And one of the other people speaking was a senior member of the Bank of England. This official was asked the question, is the UK going to ban crypto? like other countries, he said, well, you know, there's, you got to realize we have a very well-developed economy and our financial systems are very well-developed. So we don't need to control currency flight like that in the same way. You know, we're more focused on protecting consumers. And I think in the U.S., it's a very similar thing. I think if the U.S. had wanted to disallow people from holding assets in crypto, like they did with gold back in the 30s, you would have seen that long ago. Uh, crypto isn't a threat to the U.S. dollar. Bitcoin is an asset class that, like art, any collectibles, will be a portion of people's store of value. Bitcoin is a store of value. It's not a security. It's not a monetary unit that is going to displace the dollar anytime soon. So I don't think the U.S. government feels threatened in that way. What I think the U.S. regulators are focused on, however, is things that look, act, and smell like banks or securities should be regulated the same way those incumbents are regulated. So if I'm raising money for a company in the traditional kind of equity world, I sell shares of stock in my company to investors. Those investors need to have certain protections. Well, if I'm issuing tokens to people that represent an ownership interest in my company or a, a right on royalty streams or whatever it might be, those investors should have the same protections. And so why do you necessarily need a different regime of regulation for securities if one's digital and one's not? So there's some logic in having a common regulatory framework. Stable coins and altcoins. If I'm taking deposits from consumers and then I'm issuing them something else, well, that's what a bank does. It lends money against deposits. Well, maybe those altcoin and stablecoin issuers should be licensed the same way banks are so that the consumers aren't harmed. Because as investors in stable coins and altcoins, we'd all love to have the FDIC insure them for us. Well, but if they're not banks, they can't do it. So I think you're going to see a lot of regulation around altcoins, stable coins, some of the more creative instruments that are out there, more from a consumer protection perspective and trying to create a unified regimen or regime for regulatory frameworks. You'll see the White House has been, there's been some noise lately about an executive order the White House will issue. Um, not that I'm privy to it, but my belief is that it will be very focused on these things, consumer protection, and also defining who of the many regulators that exist in the U.S., is actually going to be responsible for it because you know the SEC is responsible for securities, the CFTC for commodities, you've got the banking, treasury, et cetera. You have all these people who are responsible for different aspects of this. And there isn't clear guidance, especially when it's not clear whether a particular token is a security, a utility coin, or a store of value. So yeah, <laughs> uh, I think the the one cryptocurrency, if you would, the one token that has the least to fear is Bitcoin, because the government has a very clear stance that Bitcoin is property. It's a commodity. It's not a security. It's something you own. You pay capital gains on it. The IRS, there's a little checkbox on your 1040 form where you, you know, do you own any, any crypto? Do you own any Bitcoin? And I think, you know, Bitcoin is here to stay and many other cryptos uh, as well. I think there's a lot of cleanup that has to happen. But again, it's like any new industry, you kind of let this Darwinism happen. And at some point, the, the regulators have to step in and create some order. You know, I'm not pro-regulation from a government oversight perspective when it's done in excess. I think the right amount of regulation to give people comfort so they understand how the market's going to operate and they know there are rules around the market and consumers can have protections only will adoption of crypto accelerate. Uh, you know, the fact that whether it's Robinhood or whether it's uh, Coinbase, you can't call when there's a drop in the market because your trade isn't being executed, whether it's stocks or crypto, that's a consumer issue. And so that needs to get fixed necessarily. So I, I think, you know, Good regulation, light regulation, and clarity will just make the institutional investors put more money into this business, which will be great for everybody. It'll give consumers a reason to hold some uh, of their assets in crypto. And you'll start seeing normal Main Street banks rolling out digital wallets where people will be able to custody and buy and sell.
Bitcoin and Ether and whatever other cryptocurrencies make sense. Yeah, that makes sense. They want to protect the end consumer. They don't want a random group with a white paper to go out and raise $10 billion with a kitty coin or something. They got to do their job. And yep. I guess uh, it's going to be interesting to see who's in charge of regulating the industry and how that's all going to play out. So in terms of minor financing, where it is today and predictions for the future, Obviously, a lot more capital has flowed into the space. You're seeing a lot of companies try and go public via SPACs or just get access to those capital streams. How do you see this playing out for the rest of the year and over the following years as the industry continues to grow, becomes more competitive, more institutionalized? How is all this looking today and, and over the next few years. Go back to the tech boom of late 90s. Again, you know, we talk about the internet in 1997. I took a company public in 2000 that was in the internet of things space. And I remember being on the road show, talking to investors and they were saying, you know, you got to lose more money. Everybody in the internet is losing lots of money. So you got to lose a lot more money to get more eyeballs. And, you know, we weren't in the eyeball business. And so I found it kind of funny because in 2001, when we did our secondary roadshow for that company and you know the internet crash had happened, as opposed to there being 30 other people out raising money at the same time as I was, I was the only one. And they were saying, thank God you guys are profitable. <laughs> yeah, what's happening now is you've got all these companies, all this investor dollars chasing Bitcoin mining. You know, there are arguably 23, 24 publicly traded or on the 18th now listed and six more on their way, whatever the number is, Bitcoin miners, and they're not all going to survive long term. You've got a lot of capital, arguably, you know, somewhere in excess of uh, $15 billion that's gone into the space in investment capital. And as people continue to need capital to grow, it's going to really be a kind of, you've got to be a quality company with a good business. It's going to be a lot harder for the company that, you know, has thousand miners today and is going to have says they're going to have 100,000 miners next year and is going to have to go out and raise money to do it because an investor is going to have a choice. I can either go buy a stock of one who's already public or one who's you know got scale and stability and low cost, or I can bet on somebody who says they're going to do it, but they don't have orders yet for miners and they don't have hosting, et cetera. So I think you're going to start seeing a maturation of the capital markets and it's going to get harder for newcomers unless they have a unique angle on what they're doing you know free energy they've developed their own miner and so you know, think about the constraints in this industry it's access to power access to hosting access to miners and then what prices you're paying for that and if somebody has a unique spin on it then they'll be able to raise capital not unlike in the technology industry if i were to come up with a new way to do online search I'd have to prove to somebody that I'm 10 times better than Google at it and that I could somehow be successful. I think for the automobile industry, which is a very mature industry, you know, if you're an upstart, uh, you know, there've been very few upstart companies that have succeeded. Tesla's, you know, a unique case, for example, of a company that's brand new to such a mature industry, but they're leveraging a disruptive technology to do it. And I think over the next three or four years, uh, larger miners will kind of become more and more established. And you'll have, like in any typical industry, four or five large players, a handful of medium tier players, and then a bunch of small niche players. And you know, somebody will come up with something disruptive and eventually displace us. Who knows? That's the way these, these markets work. And I'm super excited to see all of the technology innovation that's going to be driven by all the capital that you know we're all generating as miners because we're not selling our Bitcoin. We're going to do something with it. We're going to reinvest it and It'll all be in next generation technologies. What are you most excited about right now that that you're seeing? It could be mining related or um, tangential to to exactly what Marathon's working on. Like what what technology from the technologist himself <laughs> are you most excited about? Uh, that you see right now. Very excited about Web 3.0. And by that, I don't mean the metaverse. What I do mean is the, the abstraction of data from applications. So, you know, today, if you're using SAP for your finance system, the data is held by SAP. It's not held by you. If you're using Salesforce for your CRM, your data is held by Salesforce. If you're doing social media, all of your content is being held by Facebook. And oh, by the way, they're monetizing it and making money on it. Uh, and on you. So by data coming down and residing on the blockchain, you resolve a lot of problems. For one thing, I, as the owner of my data, can control who can use it and monetize it. And I can choose to lend my data to or provide Facebook with access to some of my data so I can have access to some of their services, or I can have them pay me for my data 
because I don't want to use their services or I can tell them, no, you can't have access to my data. So data ownership becomes very important and the blockchain is a great way of doing that. Same thing applies to your healthcare data, you know, your medical records, you go to a doctor, you can give them access to view your data on the blockchain, but they're never copying it or being able to hold it. So when your data only resides in one place, granted, you know, on the blockchain replicated millions of places all over the world can't be ransomware to ever because you can't re-encrypt the blockchain, right? That's the whole premise how the blockchain is secure. So ransomware disappears as a business completely. You start doing things like, okay, and this is something Michael Saylor's talked about and the folks at Twitter are starting to talk about as well, where basically, okay, if you want to communicate with me on Twitter, DM me on Twitter or send me an email, you have to have staked at least 100 Satoshi. And here's why. If you send me a bunch of spam or you DM me a bunch of trash or you're trying to do something fraudulent, you can lose that stake. So imagine all these spam houses that have, they're sending you know millions of email accounts a day they're using. They'd have to stake a lot of money. And then if they're caught spamming, they're gonna lose those stakes. And the financial incentive of spamming will disappear. The financial incentive of trolling will disappear. And so instead of having a central authority regulating that, let me, if I don't want to receive your emails, guess what? Hand over those Satoshis. I think we're gonna see a lot more of that where as soon as data moves down onto the blockchain, users start getting control of their data, you now have a real, the user gets their power back. And companies like Facebook will have to deal with you, the consumer, to get access to your data if you want to give it to them. But the key thing is you'll be in control of your data. Data will never be in transit anywhere and it won't be able to be ransomware. And I think that's, you know, that solves a foundational challenge that's really critical. The internet today wouldn't be what it is if it wasn't for the Apple smartphone or the smartphone in general, not just Apple, but Android as well. Why? This is the most ubiquitous human machine interface on the planet. And 70% of what people do on Facebook, YouTube, whatever, is all done on the phone. So if you had to do that at your desktop, it would never have blossomed into the industry that it is today. And I think in the world of blockchain and crypto, we're not quite there yet. We don't have that key technology that all of a sudden makes this ubiquitous all over the place. And that will not be a hardware device, I think it'll be software, but you know that application, that set of tools that transacting, trading, viewing, et cetera, across the broad internet. Think of it as uh, what the Netscape browser was to being able to read stuff on the internet. Google was to discovering it. We're not there yet. And that's what I'm excited about. You know, those are innovations that still have to come. And uh, you look at what, you know, Andreessen Horowitz and the big VC firms are doing, you know, they're putting billions of dollars into coming up with what the next, you know, if you would, FANG stocks are going to be in the um, FANG as in, you know, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, et cetera, are going to be for, you know, Web 3.0. And I, that's super exciting. And crypto and blockchain, obviously, are core parts of that. And Bitcoin mining is a core part of that. So that's what I'm super excited about. And, uh, you know, I've thankfully been in the tech world for long enough time to see a lot of change. And uh, I, you know, I'm very excited to see what's yet to come. The most interesting conversations I feel like are the ones where you're speaking with people who not only an understanding, foundational understanding of how the system works, how obviously markets work, economics, and the basic fundamentals of running a company, but then who can take it that next level and start talking about, okay, what if we take this innovation here, this innovation here, how do they overlap? How is this going to look? And yeah, it's, it's very clear after speaking with so many people that we're still in such the early days that 97 is, is a stat that's been thrown around, but also just when you look at how the mining difficulty works, if every four years you have a halving and this thing is the last Bitcoins being mined in 2140, just given that much time to innovate with Bitcoin, it almost seems like this type of trajectory that we're on is almost inevitable just from where the incentives lie and, and having big miners like you guys coming in and help creating a more efficient system, more sophistication in the mining industry, I think is really important because later on, if you believe Bitcoin is going to achieve a lot of the things that people talk about, you need that layer one to be extremely, extremely secure mm -hmm. and tied to real world energy. So I got two questions left. The second to last one, uh, the one I'm about to ask is going to be related to your views on Bitcoin as money. And then the final one is uh, what I like to call the Peter Thiel question. So uh, <laughs> the, this one first here, though, is in terms of 
Bitcoin, how do you view it in relation to what it is as money? A lot of people are talking about Bitcoin being this extremely, extremely disruptive innovation, not just at the technology level, but being the killer application for blockchain because it's tying energy to real world money. And it's being tied to, to real world money through energy, through miners like yourself and everyone else around the world that are decentralized, no single minor, no single government, no single entity can change it because it's a distributed decentralized system. So what, what are your thoughts in terms of the implications of this technology and Bitcoin in how humans relate to energy and money? Okay, well, sit down, uh, you know, <laughs> brew a cup of coffee. <laughs> I, I could do a whole kind of doctoral thesis on this, but high level, everything that exists is a combination of energy and information. Molecular structures are just energy with information. Cellular structures are energy and then DNA, which is programming information, if you would. So everything that exists is a combination of energy and information. Bitcoin is the most efficient way to convert energy into something portable that is fungible. You can't take a tank of hydrogen and use it for a lot of things other than burning the hydrogen or whatever else other inert properties, intrinsic properties uh, hydrogen has. But you can convert all sorts of energy into Bitcoin and that Bitcoin you can now use for all sorts of things. You can use it to pay for food. You can use it to pay for transportation. You can convert it back into energy. So you know, Bitcoin is the optimal way to convert energy into something fungible and portable. And that's how I kind of dumb it down. I know the hard money experts would you feel I'm giving very much of a kindergarten explanation here, but that's the way I explain it to people around the dinner table at Thanksgiving. It's kind of, you know, well, what is Bitcoin? Well, think of it as it's essentially just energy in a very portable form. And when it is in that form, you can now use it for lots of things. Now, Bitcoin as a currency, you know, what are important characteristics of a currency? Well, people want currencies to be relatively stable because there's an understanding that you and I have about a dollar bill and what its purchasing power is. And granted, yes, it's suffering from all sorts of inflation and its value is decreasing, but it's not fluctuating 50% a day. It's moving over the course of a year. The dollar arguably is losing 15% a year in value, in purchasing value. So if everything were denominated in Bitcoin and there wasn't another currency, yeah, then you could consider Bitcoin a great currency. And I'm not saying it doesn't have the properties to be a currency or anything like that. It's just today, the way the regulatory frameworks operate and with the relative illiquidity there is in the market, meaning that not very high volume is needed to move the price of Bitcoin a lot and create volatility. You know, Bitcoin is taxed like a long lived intangible asset, which means if I buy a bus ticket with a Bitcoin, I have to worry about the capital gains tax on that Bitcoin compared to when I bought it. So there's friction today in our systems for using Bitcoin as a currency, which I think over time will be ameliorated. However, I think that the Lightning Network and stable coins are a great short term step there, meaning you can hold your assets in Bitcoin and once a month you transfer some Bitcoin into stable coin and that's what you use for your spending and it's one taxable transaction a month and you're off to the races. Will the government issue a central bank digital currency? I fully expect most Western governments to issue what we'll call a wholesale digital currency, which replaces Fedwire, Swift, all of these interbank payment settlement systems. It won't be a digital currency where you as a consumer open an account at the Federal Reserve for US you know, central bank digital currency. They'll let the banks manage that. So the Fed doesn't want to be dealing with consumers. It's not structured to, not designed to, it doesn't have the governance rules. And, you know, banks need to take deposits and do lending. They'll continue to do that. The US dollar today is very digital as it is. It's just the challenge is the value of the dollar because government can print as much of it as they want and they can issue debt, the purchasing value of the dollar declines uh, over time. And so Bitcoin being a very finite asset in its the number of Bitcoin that'll be available is a great store of value. And I think that over time, you'll see digital currencies becoming more the norm, but that's gonna take quite some time. Uh, you know, today, Sweden, so I'm Swedish originally, you look at Sweden, they're 97% cashless today. I mean, you can't buy a bus ticket with cash. People look at you funny if you have cash. And it's not because of any government regulation, it's just people are very pragmatic and practical and you know everything's done on your cell phone. In the US, we still have 30% of our economy in cash today. Uh, even during the pandemic, we still had 30% of transactions being done in cash, retail and, and general purchases. So. Um, you'd think with all the e-commerce going on, it would have all gone digital because, you know, credit cards effectively are a digital currency. It's just 
fiat based. So if you think of the world that way, you can say that, well, 70% of our economy today, which is being done digitally, though in US dollars, is being done in a US dollar stable coin called the US dollar, right? So we're 70% digital. And then we have 30% that's done in this paper unit of this stable coin called the US dollar. So what benefit do consumers have of having a central bank issued digital currency? It's not really going to impact the consumer. Now, Will it impact banks and settlement and international transactions? Absolutely. And so by settling trade digitally, you shave time off, you eliminate cost in the intermediaries, but you know, there's a whole ecosystem of companies and institutions who live because of that friction that they create today. And they will eventually have to evolve or be eliminated just by the advent of these digital currencies. But uh, I think Bitcoin as a currency that we spend on a daily basis, you need to change the tax regime for that to be practical. And that's likely not gonna happen soon. Though, when you think about it, the IRS has spent a lot of money building tools to be able to look at money movements on the blockchain. And um, I think has a pretty good handle on taxes. So it wouldn't surprise me if within five years you saw Bitcoin being viewed more as a, um, you have to have a certain amount of it to be taxing on a capital gains basis. If you're just, you know, if you're buying and selling less than $10,000, $50,000 a year of Bitcoin equivalent, uh, you're not going to have to declare it. So that'll allow for more active use of circulation. But again, it comes down to practical. What's the friction involved? You know, if I'm going to pay for something with my phone, I can choose in my Apple wallet to pay with a credit card, my debit card. Apple Cash, whatever, as a consumer, it's not going to bother me. It's where do I want to hold my money? I want to hold my assets in Bitcoin because that's not going to lose value. The dollar might, but I can move money from Bitcoin into the dollar once a month and get away with it. So um, I know some of the uh, hard money maxis will hate on me for that, but that's kind of my, my thinking on that. I, I, I think these things take time. You know, in 2000, uh, when the company I took public in the Internet of Things world, I was sure that by 2005, everything would be connected to the internet because it just made all this sense. And here we are 20 plus years later, and it's still not quite there. We're getting there, but it's still not quite there. I think this is going to take time too. It's a great answer. <laughs> I, uh, I, I love digging into these types of things as well with miners because they just understand the energy side. And uh, it's clear that you've, you've gone down the rabbit hole and uh, I've really thought, thought that through. So um, appreciate you sharing that. Final question, the Peter Thiel question. What is one belief you hold to be true that the majority of people would disagree with you about? I think that we have a tendency as a society and as a species to look at situation and project on the future an outcome which is unreal. And I'm very optimistic about society. I'm very optimistic about what we're going to do relative to saving the planet and climate change. If you believed what the naysayers were saying about Bitcoin and energy consumption a few years ago, Newsweek even said, by 2020, the Bitcoin will use all the energy in the, on the planet. Well, you know, we're at 0.2 of a percent uh, of the global energy. So got a ways to go before we get there. Same thing in the 1970s, we're going to run out of oil by the 1980s and uh, the planet won't have a sufficient supply. And here we are and we're still, there's plenty of oil in the ground and we're actually moving away from oil. The world will populate itself into non-existence. Well, population growth is slowed dramatically and by 2050, we'll actually see global population decreases based on current demographic trends. You know, so all of these disaster scenarios that people have <clears throat> and project. I think the older you get, the kind of developer realization that, you know, we adapt and evolve much better than people think. And we solve problems through human ingenuity. And so I, I tend the one area where people would always argue with me is uh, it's kind of this optimistic perspective I have on, you know, we will survive. We will make it through this no matter how bad it is. We're going to figure out a way to do it because that's how we are designed as by nature to be. You know, humans are designed as survival machines, just like a virus is a survival machine. Look at the pandemic. You look at, you know, COVID, it went from a highly lethal disease to a disease that spread easily because as if it was killing off its hosts too much, it wouldn't survive. And so what it does is it ends up surviving by making itself benign instead of malignant. And the common cold is a, a COVID-like, it's a coronavirus. 
And it may have been something absolutely lethal sometime in the past. And now every year you get a cold and so what? So I think, uh, you know, we will find a way to innovate and survive always through all these. There is no financial crisis we won't be able to come out of. Will people get hurt? Yes, that always happens. But I think if you look at the greater good, um, we'll always find a way to resolve it. So, you know, I, I tend to be proverbial optimist, if you would, not to the extent of saying, uh, oh, no matter what, things will be good. No, there'll be pain and there'll be a trouble, but we will always find a way to resolve issues, uh, whether it's an asteroid coming to hit this planet or whatever it might be, I think we'll find a ways to solve these problems. That's one area where people will argue with me. And I, I've spent more time in board meetings having these types of discussions with companies around the world over the years. More times, more often than not, I'm proven right. That's great. I mean, crypto, uh, Bitcoin, they have the Bitcoin maximalists. The answer you just gave make, makes it sound like you're a, a human maximalist in a way. I am. You, and, uh, and that's great. I think the more people that take that approach and are optimistic, that's what leads, in my own personal opinion, to a lot of the innovation that you see and the overcoming of challenges is because people go and they take that approach and they find that solution and they see the silver lining and and without that, there doesn't seem to be as much hope. But when people do have that type of view, and I'm of, of that belief that you have people out there that take that type of approach, you have the ability to do pretty much anything. So thank you for, for that answer. Thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. I think that's a great, cheery, happy note to finish on. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. I'll, I'll share one little piece of Peter Teal trivia with you, just because you know, we share the last common last name. And so... Uh, <laughs> Uh, th there's always kind of a, a lot of stories that go around about him. And, and uh, you, you, if you think about when, um, uh, you know, he was one of the early investors in Facebook and Yahoo placed a billion dollar bid. And this is something he shared publicly. So it's, it's not a new story, but he was advocating to Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah, let's sell. Let's sell to Yahoo for a billion dollars. And Mark Zuckerberg said, no, you know, I'm going to have to go build this company again if I sell it. I don't want to do that. And that ended up being a very successful outcome for all those investors, you know, hundred X but more essentially. So even Peter can sometimes be uh, <laughs> wrong in his beliefs, but that's how we learn as humans. It's, we only learn from our mistakes. Our successes don't really teach us a whole lot. Very, very true. I'm glad that you had a, a Peter Thiel story. You're the first person that despite that question, always being asked to actually have um, a story on Peter Thiel to share. Great. Well, I thank you so much for having me on and uh, you know, happy to come back anytime. <laughs>